and welcome to today's webinar, SDL Trillion Docs 14 Technical Webinar. My name is Kate and I'll be your host today. Today's speakers are Dave Demir, who is the SDL Development Manager, and Katerina Momot, who is the SDL Product Owner. And we expect that today's webinar is going to last around an hour, an hour and 45 minutes, um, hopefully followed by a Q&A session. If you do have any questions throughout this um, webinar, then please put them in the Q&A box, which is on the Ask a Question tab. I'm now going to pass you over to Dave to begin the presentation. Hi, welcome all. Um, this is going to be a pretty packed webinar um, where we're trying to explain to a more technical audience on what we what we changed comparing a 3 Inbox 13 release to a 3 Inbox 14 release. So we will show you an inside view on how configuration has changed or why we made certain design decisions and what to keep your eyes open for when you are upgrading customers or upgrading your own to the latest version. So expect a lot of technical information. Um, and several of the slides are also good reference information where you potentially can do a freeze video later on to have a look on how it all works exactly because some of the, the details might require uh, more than a five minutes explanation. So let's go. Um, I think, uh, yeah, the, the release is already public. Um, the, uh, so you can already check the release notes on the public documentation sites and there is some information on the community as well. And we'll, we'll do more announcements in the coming months as well uh, for the release. Um, if we compare a version 13 to a version 14, then we see that we have a, a rebranding because technically we released SDL Node Center 13 last, now, last time and now it's called 3 dmdocs Docs 14. Um, So the agenda roughly is uh, introduction, um, then we go deeper into what's, what's inside Content Manager, a section on client tools, collective spaces where we will have uh, a demo moment, and then we go on some highlights on what has changed in the delivery side, a bit about automation, and then we have the closing thoughts. So this is roughly the agenda. I think first an important thing when you release software is that, yeah, we would like everybody to upgrade and um, as an engineering organization, we would also like to uh, get rid of some of the uh, four, five, six year old releases um, because yeah, time goes, goes forward and there are new expectations um, on functionality, platform support, security. So this table gives you a view of um, what, yeah, if we apply the SDL policy on um, supported and, and it's deprecated to the trillion box product line. Um, overall, we apply the product policy. Um, the small change is on the uh, Node Center 2016 release where we extended it a bit um, so that uh, in a there is a bit more grace period to move from a collaborative review-based setup into a, a future uh, review-based setup. But there is more to come on that later. Um, in general, the slide deck tries to uh, use a couple of yeah, highlighting. Um, so we have green, orange, and red, where green is the new stuff or the supported stuff. Orange is deprecated, so it still works, but it's tagged that there is a better thing available, and obsolete means it's gone. Um, you'll also see that some slides are earmarked because we had decent size service packs, so 3 Docs 13 SP1 and 3 Docs 13 SP2 already contain a lot of these goodies, but the, the webinar itself compares uh, the 13.0 to the 14.0. So we do some repeat business here for things that you might already have up and running. And when that happens, then you'll see the earmarks on the top right of the slide. So roughly what happens, I think, um, is that we're going to introduce 3 Docs draft space. 
as, as a completely new functionality that will be halfway throughout the session. We'll have our already existing items on uh, the delivery stack and the content manager side. We're going to introduce that we're landing to the Index Collaborative Review and already start to remove some functionality because we actually have better stuff available through draft space. And um, as messaged, the uh, quality assistant and content editor are no longer part of the 3 Docs 14 release. So that's the high-level overview. Now we go a bit deeper. Um, so content editor, or RxOpus, is completely gone. That means that all of the automation features around it for a 3 Docs 14 release will error out to give you a hint that those features are no longer available, so you cannot enable them. And Content Editor was also, in, uh, was also a button, an edit button, under Collaborative Review. And that edit button uh, also has to be removed, because it doesn't make sense anymore to do an edit operation there, certainly when we have draft space available. So Collaborative Review in this 3D and Docs 14.0 release is only about reviewing and commenting, and no longer about editing. Quality Assistant was only visible inside Content Editor. So yeah, as Content Editor goes, then Quality Assistant is gone as well. So if we dig deeper on Content Management, um, it has had some names in the past, but for reference, yeah, this is the piece that was called Live Content Architect, or even Trisoft, and I think the InfoShare code name is the one we keep around because that's the one which is, uh, has been proven to be stable. Um, so if you compare setups, and it depends a bit on of where you're upgrading your, your environment from, here you see the main highlights. Um, we're introducing an ish CS space that stands for collective spaces, where Kate will present more about. Um, we switched from uh, 30 to bit 32-bit client tools to 64-bit client tools. Um, I think those are the highlights. And then the, mess, then the menu inside Oxygen or XMetal has switched from uh, Knowledge Center to 3D and Box. Those are the highlights. That's effort that you can see top right that we already delivered to you in 13SP1. So what happened in the 14 release? Um, well, most of it is the same, so for your reference, but the green items are the ones to pay attention for. So we added Windows 2019 support, and we switched to .NET Runtime 472, which comes out of the box on Windows 2019. Um, so that's not too difficult. On the deprecation side, um, yeah, because we always try to support two platforms, it means that while uh, when we add Windows 2019, it implicitly means that Windows 2016 becomes a deprecated platform and has a reasonable chance of being removed next time around. And that is also something that, because we added 2019, it also pushes 2012 R2 out. But that indeed is already a relatively older Windows platform. Um, so these are still working, but they're just pushed as uh, might be well, there are better versions available for that, so we would like you to upgrade. On the obsolescent part, I think it's important to highlight that we are going to uh, stop supporting Internet Explorer. Um, Microsoft already has the Edge browser available for quite a long time. And there are also yeah, Chrome and Firefox as very important browsers. So we didn't explicitly break it in the, uh, in the Content Manager Explorer. Um, so that one still works, um, but the whole new development called the draft space is uh, not tested at all on Internet Explorer. So, um, another one is Windows 7, which is very popular on enterprises, but I think by the time most customers roll out this release, um, that the Windows 7 is in an extended, extended setup that's uh, all of them are moving to Windows 8.1 or even Windows 10 by then. So that is where we are aligning with what's happening in the field. This slide is also um, a repeat from the, the webinar from last year. 
Um, but I think the most important changes are in the boxes, and it indicates that batch import is now gone on the server, and we have a, a fully fledged replacement by a client tool called Content Importer. And yeah, Kate will give more information, but it's really revamped and has a lot more options and possibilities. Of course, the API is also still there. And we also really removed some uh, API 2.0 endpoints. I'll get a little bit more detailed later on. A big change that happened um, was Oasis Data 1.3. So um, I think this is a, a brief summary of what we did on Oasis Data. Um, the standard is now described in Relax NG, while in the past it was kind of a parallel maintained version of DTDs and schemas. But it's the RNGs that are now leading, and the RNGs are then they are used as, as a basis to generate the DTVs and the schemas, and there are some open source tooling available to help you on that. And you also need those tools uh, if you have specific specializations you want to run. But that's not necessarily an SDL thing, that is an uh, Oasis data thing. Um, for SDL, it was about doing a proper specialization on, on top of data 1.3. So we no longer adapt the OASIS data files with our proprietary attributes, but we really did a proper SDL-specific specialization. So for us, the scope was that you could store and edit and publish data 1.3 files, and that all of our integration should work, so XML editors and previews and rendering. Um, there are no changes regarding extra tooling management features, so there are no extra reports on KeyRef or something like that. It is, we can eat them and we can uh, use them in publishing. That's the core of it. So as a reminder, these are how a lot of customers are working. They're using the Oasis data uh, public identifiers. And now we added um, the 1.3 folder next to it. Now those are mostly for reference because out of the box you don't really use them, as we still point the uh, generic OASIS identifier to the 1.2s. And we introduced a new SDL public identifier, and that points to the data SDL 1.3 folder. So that's the, the change. Um, in that data SDL specialization, we did the proper stuff for our proprietary attributes. CID, VAR ID, VARF, initial condition. And we also continue our simple example on a specialization, so thereby we prove that everything works. So that's. Now, I only mentioned uh, the, these four guys CID, initial condition, and VAR ID, and VARF, but we had more default proprietary attributes mixed in the DTD. Uh, the var in use and the var assigns and the preview version and this result and link expat and those are all gone from our specialization and they have moved inside configuration and the following four next slides specify that template specification XML got some extra sections to to make that happen so in the past where we used to have an ish link expat section expression that was used by publication manager to generate those little hash sections in the tree. Well, that has now moved into the template specification, and it's outside of the DTDs, so outside of the document types. Um, so th that's a similar thing for others, like um, uh, the, the label XPAT and the link XPAT also moved outside of the DTDs in the template specification file. Um, as a reminder, if you see Publication Manager 3, then you get sections like Images and Topics and Congress. There are two behaviors. If the documents are just checked in, or if the topics are checked in, then Publication Manager relies on the metadata fields. And they can use the metadata that comes from the CMS server. But if you have something locally checked out, suppose you have installing SIM card and battery open in your Oxygen editor in your local storage, 
then the metadata is not accurate, and then we use those uh, template specification link XPaths and all that to extract which images are exactly linked here and all that. So that's something to keep in mind how it all works. Um, so again, template specification got specifics on the graphic templates and the link templates and the hyperlink templates. Um, as you can see, there is also a note that says that these should be more or less aligned um, with your iWrite plugins. Um, that extract the metadata, but that is not always feasible to make them exactly the same. So that's why we had to duplicate uh, the configuration. I think for 90% of, of you guys, it all works um, out of the box. But yeah, if there is a specific situation, then it can be tweaked here. And there is a reminder on top that says like, these should be very closely aligned with the iWrite plugin configuration that fills up those fish links fields and all that. Template specification also holds uh, the configuration for those, what happens in the app within insert before and what happens on the current node and on the, uh, so the, the root elements and the, the topic ref uh, attributes. So that's also stored inside this file. Um, I think that's the framework we want to tell you about here. Um, what else regarding Vita Bundle 3 is that, yeah, we have new public identifiers. And if you restore our delivered empty and demo databases dumps, then you will start with SDL public identifiers. Um, for existing databases, well, we created a script that submits those. And um, even new editor templates are submitted because of Vita Bundle 3, like learning group map and learning object and troubleshooting. Um, I don't think a lot of you worry about it, but we no longer deliver the Dutch files as editor templates. So it's only English, German, Chinese, and Japanese that we offer as uh, editor templates. So what really has changed is that, yeah, we did a lot of work in the style sheets. Actually, the style sheets are based now on Vita Open Toolkit 3.1. Um, so they're a bit more recent, and that could mean that you see a couple of things have yeah, are rendered in a slightly different way. We had to refactor them a little bit because, yeah, to our preview is run from Java code and from .NET code. And yeah, the only compatible engine there is XSLT 1.0. Um, so that doesn't exist yet in .NET, the 2.0 version. All of the XML editors work. The plugins are reviewed or the type on toolkit. Um, there is for collaborative review even a hotfix package that you could enable with a 1.3. Our um, content delivery site also knows how to handle it. So those are all stuff we did to make it work. Specific remark here on MathML. Although Dita 1.3 offers MathML, we don't do anything specific to render it. So this is an example how it's rendered. Here you see a P tag that says we're going to do something like this in a formula. And in the preview, you see that piece rendered. But the whole map and L code base is accepted into the repository, but we don't do anything specific with it to render it. So that is um, just to be clear that that is not something we offer out of the box. Um, so all in all, the summary is that we did, that we offered Dita 1.3 as backwards compatible. And uh, if you just install a 3 in box 14 on your existing environment, you will continue using Oasis Data 1.2, unless you do something by submitting new editor templates that are pointing to SDL Data 1.3. So in the end, your database contains Oasis Data 1.2 material and SDL Data 1.3 material mixed in. Um, it should all work because it's all backward compatible. And um, we do not do any legacy conversion because that is something we cannot do out of the box. That is requires a lot of information architecture if you even want to do that. And the benefits we believe are not that high to switch all of that. So that was it on Vita 1.3. Um, another thing that we did is we got we actually centralized 
all of our metadata screens now over metadata config XML. Metadata config XML is already a long time in use for the client tools, but it's now also used in the web client. Actually, in the various screens we have in the web client, because we have the content manager, we have collaborative review, and we also have draft space. And in essence, they're all configured from the same metadata config XML. That also means that you don't have to waste or spend time anymore on the red dialog classic ASP files. Those are dead. Quick note on the web client preview. Um, the preview, as stated, uh, can render the data 1.3 stuff. But I think the most important one is that just like we render the latest available version of images, we now also, also do a conref resolving. So on the left-hand side, you see the old behavior, where a conref is just yeah, not rendered in the basic web client preview. But now you get a latest available lookup of the library so that we resolve the conref. Translation organizer didn't get big fixes. It mostly has to do with, with uh, platform support. Um, just as a hint that the naming convention for the world server project names has changed. So here you can see what has changed exactly. Um, the, the key thing is that we now introduce an identifier because we, there were certain scenarios that uh, a job was submitted twice into World Server. And yeah, it's good that it's inside World Server, but it's not good that you might get a, a double translation cost. So to be able to check if a job was already submitted, uh, we had to do, introduce a unique identifier, and that's, that's what that red box is about. And that's the one we use to double check if we're not doing a, a double submit. When talking about translation organizer towards TMS, it's indeed again about platform support, but you'll find the details in the documentation. Um, TMS also changed their authentication type on top of their API, and yeah, we comply with that. So they had a notion of besides the CTA library and that magic GUID, there is a notion of API key and secret, and now also user credentials. So inside the translation organizer.config file, you can now have authentication mode with API key and secret, or you can have a user credentials with an explicit username and password. And here is a small table on how it works. I show you the configuration file here, but yeah, these days we are pushing that you should go over the PowerShell configuration command log module. And that command has also got an extension that it can handle the new parameters. Next topic is publishing. That was a big effort over the last uh, yeah, year and a bit. Um, the publish service component, so the, the one that was there from the start of the product, is a crucial because you can submit all your, your material inside the database, but it's also very important that you get the stuff out of your repository and make it useful in all kinds of output formats. Um, so we took great effort in, in porting this, this component to newer technology. So it's now written in .NET. But along the way, we also yeah, reorganized it a bit so that we have more possibilities for achieving better performance. So the, de the performance depends a bit on your data sets and what you want to do. But as you can see, the numbers are, are pretty big. And that's, uh, and I'll explain a little bit more on where we got those improvements. So this is the, the high level picture of the old public service. Um, so it's, uh, there was an, an export for publication item. And then there was a train. And that started the public service process. And in that public service process, typically, you would run a bunch of VB scripts or some PowerShell to do stuff. And then eventually, you would upload the material again into the repository as a PDF or a zip file. That is kind of the classic flow. Um, and that worked. But I think now we refactored, and it looks different. So there is still a big generic thing that we call now publish, and that has a background task event called publish. And 
that publish also triggers plugins. So it's a train of plugins that we now see. So all kinds of wagons connected where there is a more modular approach and, and clear responsibility. And all of these things are now written in compiled code, which easily outperforms uh, scripting. Uh, definitely because these days, yeah, CPUs are multi-threaded and all that, and scripting was not that great at multi-threading. So besides that, um, avoiding scripting, um, there were other things we did. Um, in the past, we did a compatibility. Uh, we um, we dropped or published all of the material that's inside the baseline while publishing, and that often meant that you were pushing way too much information out. Now we respect the conditions. So that actually means that we start with the root map, and then we go to the first level submaps, and then to the topics and the libraries, and so on and so on. So we only export after conditional publishing. So using the root map, half of the the map disappears because because of conditions, then yeah, all of those files are not exported to the file system that of course gives you a massive performance benefit. And uh, another thing is that in the past, the published service, the old component, did not respect the background task regarding retry actions. Now it does respect that, so there are possibilities to decide how many retries and on which error numbers you should retry. That is now all respected and all part of the standard delivery. Pretty dense picture that puts some components in perspective. So the first piece is a bit fixed code where we do the publishing and yeah, mark that a publication output is in the status publishing, exporting missing objects, then we have a, a scaled out piece where we export a lot of files in parallel, the metadata, and then we have our train of plugins where you can see we have plugins that run before a compare operation. We have an extension point on the compare. We have an extension point on combining languages in one book or in one, one publication. And then all of the other plugins that you want to run and essentially, in the end, we finish with the classic draft, release candidate, or occasionally a failed. Uh, so another thing worth mentioning is that the original drop path for all of those files was pretty deep and pretty lengthy. And that has now switched to a, a random temp folder that is a lot shorter. So we have a lot more room for custom file names. and yeah, which publication is still there because we generate a specific XML file in the root folder that you can nicely track what it is about. Um, what else? Yeah, that uh, whole publish plugin configuration is also using the ish conditions. So that means that you can now put post-processing under certain conditions that it should be run for certain output formats and not for other output formats. So the wagons of that plugin train can be conditionally decided depending on your output format. I think that's a nice one. Another one is that where in the past we would have two registry settings that pointed to an XML file on which metadata to export. Well, you can now decide which metadata to export per output format. And that's also a performance increase because usually you only need that rich metadata for one or two of your output formats, but not for all of them. So again, uh, a possibility for speed. As I said, the compare um, is now uh, a plugin and, and again, respects all of those things uh, as mentioned here. So a couple of highlights if we compare the old one, public service, with the new one, is that the old one did everything from the baseline, so all of the selected versions, and now we respect the flow of the map and then the baseline. The old one ended with logical IDs on the file system, and then you had to run a script to get to file names. Well, now the standard publish already ends with file names because that is what you typically need. DTDs is also a slowing component, so we chose to no, not 
well, to only load with DTDs once and then push the default attributes to through downstream because then you don't need to load with DTD over and over again and that also greatly perf uh, is a great performance boost. It's multi-threaded as said, uh, the VB script became compiled, so you have a lot more options there and even inside your plugins you can do multi-threaded if you need it. Uh, missing objects, we only do one missing object per logical identifier and not over and over again, so that uh, is again a performance improvement. Um, I think those are the main highlights uh, of that. Um, for you guys, professional services partners and, and the more advanced tools guys on the line here, um, we now also offer a TriSoft InfoShare plugins common assembly. So a lot of our plugins had some, what was considered by some magic inside. Well, we now refactored our code that the magic is now also available to you guys. So a couple of yeah, common functions are now available for you and, and can be used directly in your plugins instead of um, getting to some hidden code. So that's available. Looking at time, um, there is, as said, we are moving from a system which was there for over 10 years and we had to refactor it. So there were some things that over time were a bit strange to say the least and I, I think I want to quickly highlight two of them. One of them is about determining versions and the other one is about exporting illustrations. So we rewrote the whole publish from scratch and, and reversed our previous version of it. Um, but there were some weird shortcuts that were taken that we didn't want to maintain because in the long run they don't make sense and they don't make it predictable enough. So it should be under, it should be easy to whiteboard and explain and not be about magic. So on the determining versions, there was something weird that um, that we now only respect the working language and the working resolution. And in the past, there was some performance shortcut that if the requested language of publishing and the working language on the publication version were the same, then it would do different interpretations. So that one has been removed, but it does mean that there are situations potentially that a customer could rely on it. We have a, a solution for most scenarios in a couple of slides. On the resolution side, so you specify resolutions on your output format. Also there, there were uh, things that, yeah, that the resolutions on the output format for us mean that you only need, you all, you all, you need all of them available and not one of them. And some people saw that as a fall through mechanism, but we see that as you must have them all. And if we say you must have them all, it also has an effect for us if a publication output eventually ends with release candidate or with draft. And that's what we try to solve now with the resolutions to export flag. So there is on an output format, you will now have a box that says resolution to export. By default, it will say we'll export all resolutions because you requested that. And then it's mostly yeah, the classic example is you have a web page and it has a low resolution thumbnail and if you click on it, you click on it then you get a, a pop-out that gives you the high resolution picture. That's how we interpret all resolutions are required because you need the low and the high. But some customers also interpret it like if the high is there, then I'll use the high. If the high is not there, then I'll use the low. So as a fallback mechanism. And that has effects, of course, on ending up with a release candidate or with a draft. So you can choose a bit of the behavior by this dropdown. Um, this is a table that you can spend more than five minutes time on trying to interpret, but this is a very accurate table on how it used to work in the past, given a certain situation. If topics or if images are available in low in high draft or released or only one low is available and all that, what it ended up while publishing, how it ended up right now with the all resolutions option and with the first resolution option. So that's where you can see that we have 
most of the behavior back because we had one version in the middle where it all became draft because we were very strict. Now we have two release candidates back because we selected first resolution. So the only thing that changed is the bottom one. Um, and I think that's an edge case. Um, and then, yeah, there are still reasons why uh, you don't hit. You're not able to release stuff, but that's uh, more detailed. So if you have the slides and you have this problem, then this table will help you to understand what we did. Near the publish is is also the unpublish. Um, that doesn't make sense for PDF, but that does make sense if you publish into uh, a content delivery stack. So like our dynamic experience delivery stack. And um, if you submit items in there, you also want a way to unsubmit, so unpublish those items. In the very first version, we delivered you only at an online offline flag. Um, but that still meant that the information was still inside that content delivery database. Now we added the unpublish, and we added it in the content manager as a generic system, which we applied to our SDL dynamic experience delivery stack. But it, in theory, could also be done towards other deliveries. So let me quickly explain how that works. This is the publish happy flow diagram. So the user creates this publication output. And then you end up with a status to be published. You press the Publish button. Then we go to Pending on the queue. Eventually, it's picked up by the Publish. And then the publishing either goes to deploying a draft or deploying a release candidate, depending on baselines and release statuses and all that. That's on the CN, on the, on the Content Manager side. Once the, all of the material is transported into the delivery stack, then the CM does a check on the remote side if the deployment worked or didn't work. And we also keep a flag if we deployed or not. So that happened already in the version 13.0. What was added a little bit more recently is that we now also have an unpublish. So you have your item in one of these statuses. You press the unpublish button. You get an unpublished pending. We do a local CMS site, a couple of checks. And then we actually check the remote side, so the content delivery site, if the items are completely cleaned up um, by using their deployer system. And when that happens, then we go to to be published. There are also possibilities for failed, that are the unpublished failed and all that, but that's something you'll find out. This is the generic flows. So to offer that functionality, we extended our publication output workflow with unpublished pending and unpublishing and unpublishing failed. We have a flag that knows if a certain output format or a certain publication output was passed to a remote silo, like a content delivery stack. We also keep track of the event ID. Um, there are a couple of events to be raised handlers for that and, the, uh, and a button in the user interface. So that are the things you will see in, in your configuration files that have changed. And that's where they come from and what they support. So that was the publish and unpublish in this release. Next is a bit about the API. Not that much has changed. I think the most important one is that we introduced a couple of functions around the background task. So there is now a possibility to create a background task entry without going over some dummy update I write metadata plugin to raise an event. So that is now there. There is a find operation where you can also query what's inside the queue um, and have a view on that together with the retrieve if you really want to know what went wrong. So picking up the, the mini log files that we attach um, for that thing. So again, like our public APIs, all document, all documented. And there is a one basic command that's already available in this remote. As indicated in the beginning, we also deprecated a couple of API calls. Um, and they're about API 2.0. Um, most of them, as you can see in the table, have already 
an alternative on API 2.5, and yeah, most of those calls are really already deprecated for several major releases, but now we had to let go of them uh, because it was blocking development. A more specific few, these are the calls that really went, and these are the calls we still mark as deprecated because we don't have a good alternative for you guys yet, so we still have to work on that. So setup-wise, again, a massive reference table, but if you look at all of the XML settings configuration files, comparing a 13.0 with a 14.0, then you see that not a lot has changed on what can be done configuration-wise, so they're all still the same compatibility levels. We added one about collective spaces, where draft space is the most prominent one. So that's a new XML settings entry. But per file, you see some highlights of what has changed. Some of the stuff I already explained. So we have unpublished in there. And of course, the old published service is gone. So exports for publication is gone. Um, batch import is gone. So those are naturals. Um, same over here. So this table is a reference for you guys later. If, like, if you don't really get what has changed and why it has changed, then this gives you some of the highlights, but most of them is pretty predictable, I feel. So suppose you have your hands on the installation media, so the info share installation media, then yeah, what would you do compared to the previous releases? Well, more or less the same regarding third party stuff. Not a lot has changed. You could use a Windows 2019 and you require 472 at least for .NET runtime. You no longer require MSXML4, and MSXML6 comes implicitly with the operating system. We still require Microsoft Distributed Transaction Coordinator at install time, but we do not require it at runtime. We have the Microsoft ODB provider that allows you to do communication um, encryption in flight between the application server and the database server. And then, um, yeah, we have some things with, with Java um, where we rely on Adopt Open JDK because that is, in the community, one of the longer supported releases and that you don't necessarily require a support contract with Oracle. That's it for the content manager side. Now we can switch to Kate for the client tools. Kate, are you there? Kate, are you there? Uh, yeah, hi all. Just a couple of seconds here and waiting when Bright Talk is processing my screen. Great. Uh, so let's continue with the client tools. Uh, so, um, client tools, oh, sorry. Yeah, uh, client um, tools have the same support uh, in 14 versions as in, uh, in uh, 13 SP2. So uh, Oxygen uh, 20 version, Robotex 7.1, and Xmetal 12 and 12G Japanese, uh, all of them of uh, uh, 64 bits is uh, supported now. And uh, uh, as well as all client tools is moved to uh, 64 bit support. It's a publication manager, condition manager, con and Imposter and <clears throat> author and bridge, and for sure all our client tools are ready for Dita 1.3 uh, document type handling. Uh, yes, so I want to <clears throat> repeat one more time that uh, in from uh, 13 SP2. Uh, we moved uh, to support 36-bit uh, systems, so all 32-bits uh, uh, is obsolete. So that means that uh, we have uh, more memory space uh, for working with the big uh, uh, imports in content import and uh, with a big publication in our publication manager. 
And in previous version, um, when user um, make uh, publishing and something go wrong, uh, it's uh, quite tricky to them um, was to uh, get the final log of this processing, these errors and warnings. Uh, the scenario was looks like uh, that the user should uh, uh, switch to other tool with CM and go to the particular place and uh, start working with this log. But from this version, for now it's possible to make it right from publication manager. So for now, uh, in uh, for uh, context menu for each uh, uh, publishing outputs, you can find the item save data uh, log, and it helps to save some time. And uh, also, this uh, imp the next improvement that can uh, reduce the switching between uh, different tools in Trident Docs is uh, searching for, for publications uh, in Publication Manager. Uh, almost uh, the same functionality we already have in uh, CM. And for now, it's available in Publication Manager by choosing a right value in looking fields. It's entire repository for publication. Uh, uh, I want to emphasize that it's, uh, uh, it's still um, some technical needs to divide searching for publication and for other items in repository because searching for publication is still a SQL query, so it's not a full text search we saw or seen uh, like for other items in repository, so we need uh, to uh, make such user experience decision here. And uh, a non-issue for this feature is this that uh, uh, search is case sensitive and um, uh, maps and resources fields uh, then supports multiple values. And next, well, let's switch to content importer. Uh, in uh, this re uh, release, content importer has uh, major changes. Uh, so uh, for now, you can process more cases uh, for imports. Uh, it's available to import translations, other file types like PDF, docs. So, uh, the user experience is uh, smoother and comprehensive. Uh, each separate use case um, have own flow with relevant properties to set up. Uh, there are uh, better progress bar representations and more way to manage uh, user progress because user can pause it and go for lunch, for example, and then uh, back and resume it. Uh, and uh, uh, from other um, side, it's easily uh, to make the night import because there are possibility to uh, go to the uh, important uh, stage right after the conversion uh, without any interruptions. Uh, and uh, for sure, um, uh, some performance improvements uh, uh, was made. In. So uh, let's compare how um, looks uh, old. Uh, content reporter, so you can see there are big screen with a lot of different options, fields, buttons, so it can uh, a little bit confuse our users. And for a new one, I uh, see there are three different uh, flows, uh, data without conversion, data with conversion or translations. Also some information about the um, latest import, so it's easy to see how a previous import uh, uh, was finished or what is the current status of them, and so it's easy to uh, continue them. Uh, and uh, as you see at the last screen, that's, uh, for example, data import with conversion contain only relevant fields as properties as it's needed uh, to make this import. So, uh, progress bar. Um, yeah, progress bar was uh, yeah, improved, so it uh, uh, let our users know how many files uh, 
I was already processed and how many files left and uh, some information about uh, time estimations and uh, summary of previous import is something that uh, I was lacking in a previous version. Uh, and uh, you can see all these options about resume and uh, console. So uh, in this version, in case if you need to stop your import process, you need now close the whole application. You just uh, uh, can uh, press the buttons and jump to the first screen just to start your import from uh, the beginning. And uh, uh, restart buttons uh, means that uh, for sure your import uh, will start uh, from the beginning. But in case if uh, files was already processed and there are no any changes in them, the system will uh, skip them as protest. Uh, uh, and uh, in case if the user want to change the settings or the change or made uh, have made some changes uh, in the files, the system will recognize there as new and uh, uh, process them again. And it's an uh, uh, easy way uh, to jump. Uh, uh, to the particular files to process warnings and uh, uh, errors that the user have uh, while importing files and jump uh, uh, to the folder with this target file or just uh, uh, op directly open it uh, from the context menu. And uh, for sure, um, uh, content importer for now available via command line, so it's uh, simple way uh, to um, make uh, automata automatizations for uh, customers, uh, so um, import by uh, some schedule or uh, freak, uh, regular repeatable imports is available. Uh, we are using some scripts. And we are working on uh, stability and performance of content importer. And uh, the first uh, uh, main changes that was made is uh, uh, improvements performance for conversion stage. Uh, the biggest changes means that uh, for now we store metadata in a separate file. So that's uh, um, let us make uh, file map XML smaller, and that means that less memory used to the fast processor, and it's easily to apply XSLT uh, for the smaller files. And so just to show the numbers, how dramatically different is uh, for a really large publications, so the uh, time for importing was. Uh, a uh, decrease from almost 29 hours uh, uh, to uh, almost five hours. Uh, right after uh, improvements for conversion stage, we also uh, uh, worked on uh, performance of import phase, and so, uh, we provide uh, a possibility to set the different numbers of uh, workers, uh, workers uh, to make the import so it's uh, control level of uh, parallelization, and so the default value is uh, for workers, but uh, uh, trying to choose an optimal uh, number, uh, you need to keep in mind that it's still client server operation, so try to keep a balance and not to down your server. Uh, and uh, for now, uh, content partners support conversion from DTIs uh, to um, SDL doc types. And uh, let's move to other our other projects. Uh, so uh, now let's talk about subject matter expert and their role in modern uh, documentation flow. So uh, all of us know about traditional documentation flow. It's required to train technical author uh, who try to uh, uh, combine a piece together and play with the Legos of text and uh, time to time farm small pieces of content for others to contribute to. Whereas in you, uh, documentation workflow means that uh, the 
primary author became um, uh, subject matter expert became a primary author. Uh, so in the product company, it's engineers and uh, a product manager and other organiza organizations could be academics, or scientists, financial, or other experts. And uh, for sure, they uh, they are experts in uh, some particular domain industry, and they want to be experts uh, there. They don't want to be experts in technical writing, in, in true technical writing. And even more, sometimes organizations have no time or budget to train them. Uh, so uh, they need a tool that should be uh, easy to use from one side, but uh, uh, power enough from other. So we want to introduce you our collective space. Uh, it's a uh, um, pr uh, product uh, uh, that contains uh, two tools. First of all, is draft space, easy but uh, powerful authoring for subject matter experts. And draft space is available in 14 uh, versions, so you can already try it and work it and uh, uh, suggest uh, to customers. And um, uh, second one is review space. It's an uh, intuitive feedback and ap approval environment. And this is a thing that uh, we are working on uh, right now. So uh, yeah, you can see it uh, somewhere in the future. So uh, what region Docs Draft Space uh, can uh, propose uh, to the users? Uh, for sure, it's uh, as a way to manage content, so uh, uh, make any changes that user uh, can make, uh, uh, you know, uh, well, uh, can, uh, for example, let's say edit content here or make a, lo a lot of uh, different options that the user can are also, for example, in the world. And uh, also, it's allow uh, to uh, get the features uh, uh, of integration with our repository. So, the uh, one place where store all content with all check in, check out functionality is available here. and. Um, uh, data configuration is supported and uh, also available uh, reuse uh, content and uh, um, see, uh, observe the rendering of other uh, reusage techniques like uh, um, variables, conref, etc. Uh, also, IME support available here with uh, Chinese, Japanese, and uh, Korean. It's uh, in, in line IME. Uh, support uh, uh, draft space available in uh, uh, several languages, so user can switch uh, user interface to English, Dutch, uh, Chinese, or Japanese, and uh, it's uh, um, available to. Uh, restrict or allow uh, on organization level uh, to upload. Uh, the images of, of for, uh, from draft space by subject matter experts. So it's like a toggle between allow and not allow to make these actions. And so also as a way to set the default resolution, so how system uh, would recognize the uploaded images. And uh, also as a way to uh, use the metadata that's already used, for example, in Reach, and a way to configure. So it's uh, reuses the same API, uh, and so a way to configure it as uh, uh, always shown or, to, or only if required field needed in some cases like or insert uh, a new topic or insert new image, for example. Uh, browsers, uh, uh, such browsers supported is the um, late of Edge and uh, uh, two latest uh, major versions of Chrome and Firefox. And so there are a way to work with a, a big publication in draft space uh, by uh, using lazy loading uh, mechanism where some topics is uh, a lot and unload. So, so uh, it's smoother for user, yeah, but uh, it's uh, available to not to run out of uh, memory.
let's dip a little bit in details. Uh, so there are uh, what uh, features available in draft space in 14 version. It's a way to insert new topic, so create a new topic or insert to exist topic from a repository. It's possible to update the metadata for topics and uh, possible add new, uh, so it's upload new image or uh, insert the already existing repository or replace the current image with other ones from repository or upload by uploading them. And while inserting the image, uh, the um, default language of publication is used, and uh, uh, the resolution that is uh, set from configuration. Uh, yes, and um, our, there are a way to create a new version of a topical map, uh, but uh, and it's available only for uh, released topic or map and uh, for sure in case if publication is uh, not released. And as I mentioned before, there are all things uh, uh, that uh, there are things uh, uh, that allow us to work with uh, repository um, available. So check in, check out, and under check out is also possible from draft space. Uh, also, we respect the reusing content, uh, so there are way to uh, insert a corner, for, uh, render it, and uh, remove or replace it. But for sure, I want to pay your attention that there, there are no way to edit a corner content inside the publication. Uh, and uh, uh, regarding to conditions, uh, they are only rendered, so there is no way to uh, delete or change them. And variables also result, and the user can uh, remove the variables, but uh, can't insert them. Uh, in line editing for IME, as you see, uh, we are it's uh, quite uh, either from user perspectives, and it's available for Korean, Chinese, and Japanese. And for now, it's demo time. So let's imagine that I'm a publication manager, publication captions, who want to share the link with my subject matter expert. I uh, go to the CM, I, I find the publication I want to show, choose a particular version, and press button draft and line. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so the publication is opened is the new buttons. Oh, is a new tab, sorry. Uh, and so, so um, how I can get the link to the publication? The one way to get it is to copy it from the address bar of your browser and uh, share it with uh, uh, your subject matter expert. The second one is to go through the outline. And in case if you want to focus your subject matter expert on uh, some particular, maybe I can make it bigger. No. Uh, and for some particular topic, for example, in my case, it's Bluetooth connection. I want, uh, I can uh, get the link for this topic in context of publication uh, from context menu. And let's see how it works. As, and as you see, that uh, uh, my publication is focused on this particular topic that I want to see, as well as uh, my outline. So, a um, couple words were about the lazy loading. As you see, uh, the, my Bluetooth publication, uh, Bluetooth topics, uh, of now is uh, visible on the screen here and. Uh, some topics are previous and next uh, is already loaded. So what happens if I will scroll? As you see, new topics are uh, starting to load. 
In case if I, for example, uh, will jump for the end, end all the topics uh, are near the focused one. Yeah, so uh, some previous and next topics is loading, and it's allow uh, to uh, sh uh, to provide our users smooth uh, experience from working with big publication. Because in case if uh, my publication will uh, would be a real big, the all topics will be unload, and this allow um, to. Uh, use memory efficiency. So let's back to my topics and let's observe uh, how uh, how the interface of uh, draft space looks like. Uh, you can see the main menu and the top is a green one. It's a menu that uh, sh uh, show as a group of main elements as show a relevant uh, actions that user can pretend with a different type of topics. For example, let's see now. For now, I have on the start structure in line advanced uh, and tools uh, items here. But in case if I jump into task topic, you can see the task uh, operation, uh, task uh, group of actions also uh, become uh, available here. Yeah, so uh, what's about what other things are available uh, generally uh, in uh, user uh, interface? So uh, right here, it's available to change the language of the interface and for sure to apply these changes or uh, uh, tap uh, with all publications should be reloaded. I won't do this now. I will keep my English. Uh, so the other things uh, that you can see in the interface, it's outline, it's table of content uh, for whole publication with some additional actions uh, that user can pretend. So it's a way to reorder uh, the table of contents and uh, move the topics down, uh, left or right. Uh, and for sure some additional um, uh, features that we will discuss a little bit later, like insert new or exist topic. Other things that you can observe on the interface, it's a tab with XML attributes and uh, our properties tab that allow user to uh, modify the um, uh, metadata uh, uh, and uh, uh, we are talking uh, about the properties uh, uh, from uh, Trident Docs repository. Yeah, and so uh, let's uh, back to the, oh yeah, uh, one uh, more <laughs> words about this uh, property screen. And there are toggle on the top so that allow user uh, to show only optional fields or to show all of them. So it also provides the user quite smoother uh, user behavior and allow to set only necessary fields and not to get the long list of uh, our properties uh, from the start. So let's back uh, to our content here. And uh, let's see how it looks like. Uh, you see that uh, this topic have a lock icon. So uh, by pressing on it, user can get the status why he or she can't work with uh, this topic. Uh, this reason, for example, because uh, current topic is checked out by uh, somebody else. Uh, the other topics is uh, locked because it's released. And for example, this topic is uh, fully available. It looks uh, like white, and it's possible to uh, start making any changes. So I start typing uh, right now, and you see the icon was changed from the locked to unlocked. Uh, and that means uh, that the topic was uh, checked out. Uh, yeah, and for now, I have uh, two ways to uh, work with them, uh, with uh, uh, these topics. I can uh, as save my ch uh, changes. It's equal to check-in options uh, in repository as discard all changes. It's uh, uh, equal to uh, undo 
kick out options. And as you see, this action is available on topic level, so that means they uh, will be applied only for these topics. And on the top of the interface, you uh, see the same icons uh, that allow us uh, to save all changes or discard all changes on the publication level. So, for example, discard all changes, I see the notifications, and I'm sure that I want to pretend them. And I want to emphasize that uh, if you undo the action, there are no way to undo, undo. And in case if you um, uh, insert a new topic, if a new topic was uh, created in the repository, undo actions want to uh, remove it from the repository. And uh, if I want to save my changes, that means that in repositories, a new revision of uh, uh, these topics will be created. So let's see what we can do with already released, um, sorry, with already uh, released topic. Uh, my touchpad become cra a little bit crazy. So um, we see that this topic was uh, all uh, released. So I have an option to uh, create a new version. And I want to, to repeat one more time that uh, this option is available only for uh, topic and maps that uh, are released, and in case if publication is not released. So I choose to create a new version and got the uh, dialog with uh, setting the um, uh, properties. And I have an option to show only uh, only required fields or or show all of them. For example, it's okay for me to uh, have the same. And so, uh, this is the metadata screen that uh, organization or customer can. Um, Con, uh, configure and uh, uh, for sure there are way to show them uh, this screen always to user while uh, they uh, create a new version or show never or show only in case if uh, required field is needed. It can be set in configuration. Yeah, and uh, as you see, the Bluetooth connection topic for now is available and it's ready for editing. So I start typing, and I can save it now. So in case or uh, if editing is not enough, for my experience, I have an option to uh, insert already in exist uh, in repository topic. For example, I go to these options. I choose the topics I want to see here. I see the preview, read, and insert. As you see, the screen server um, topics was uh, inserted uh, as um, uh, child elements for Bluetooth connections. But in case if I want uh, to uh, change uh, the order, uh, I can uh, just uh, uh, make uh, uh, relevant actions in outline. And this uh, topic is locked because it's uh, released. Almost the same approach you can observe in case if you need uh, to create a new topics. Uh, so at first, you need to choose the target folder where you want to store it and uh, choose the relevant templates. OK, let's say, uh, would it be a concept? Uh, see the template in preview and move next. and. So uh, for now, I have the wrong required fields, and okay, I want, I need to create, uh, to fill in uh, the title of it, and I'm okay with other fields, so let's create. And as you see, my test topic with type of concept also was created, and uh, you can see the template that I use and that I saw in the <coughs> previous. Uh, so uh, it's about we are talking about topics, but um, uh, sometimes when users work with publications, there are some needs to insert an image, and so uh, we provide a way to 
easily to insert image from repository. Okay, let's say let it be my Bluetooth icon. So in case if I wrong can choose a not right one, I can replace it also from the repository. Oh, sorry, it's here. Yeah, I want this one. I replace it. Great. But in case if uh, replacement is not enough for me here and uh, I need to upload an image, I need to choose a folder, target folder, there where I want uh, to store my new image and the scissor button upload a new image in the bottom. Uh, so I choose it and uh, got the my folder on my local machine and can choose, for example, this icon. I also got the metadata uh, forms uh, because I need to uh, set some required fields. And yeah, finally, I got my uploaded image and uh, uh, inserted it in my publication. So, uh, and uh, let's move to my last topic here in, in my demo. It's uh, um, using external content. So, let's go for uh, topics that uh, represent uh, uh, this item's best. Uh, so, as you see, uh, we resolve the varref. And there are a way to see initial content, but I can't switch to other one, so I only can see it. And there are a way to remove a ref in case if it's needed. Uh, also, you can see here conditions here, so they are rendered, but I can do nothing with them. Yeah, I only see them as a fact that this text is conditional and condition is set for this publication. Uh, yeah, and uh, as for XREF and CONREF, there are a way to insert uh, them uh, inside the content. So um, let's see how conref is looks like. Uh, I use reuse content. I need to choose uh, the target topics. For example, if I choose this one, the system will show me that there are nothing you can select in this document. So there are also some relevant triggers that user can take. And in this topic, I already see some piece of content with ID, so I can insert it inside my publication. And here is. So you can see it, you can remove it, and uh, you can see also the original content. And un under edit here, we, uh, un uh, we mean the replace uh, this conref is other one. Oh, sorry, something go wrong. Yeah, so that looks like that. That's it from my side that I want to show you about the uh, draft space. And I think we can continue with a little bit uh, technical details. So, uh, Dave, it looks like it's your turn. Yes. Should be able to see my screen. So thanks, Kate, for uh, demoing the the draft space user interface. Um, what we what I would like to highlight here is that we try to keep the whole notion 
as, as simple as possible uh, so that it is an easy access for a lot of riders. It's not necessarily catered for advanced technical riders. I mean, they can also do their stuff in there, but it's not, a, it's not a necessarily a replacement for them. This is more for a wider audience to allow yeah, initial creation or adaptations of content and they're all browser-based and keeping in mind all the yeah, notions of publications and versioning and whatever you expect actually from our content management system. So in this part, we'll go a little bit deeper on how we solve some of the problems. So first of all, I think deployment-wise, um, this picture highlights a typical uh, content manager application server where we have our Windows services on the back end and we have our, if you need it, the local secure token service, the classic content management explorer web client, the web services endpoints, and we now have a, an extra one that is collective spaces, where draft space is the thing that uh, Kate demonstrated. Um, so it has the same installer, and you just have an extra parameter to specify where it is. It complies with a lot of the non-functional requirements that we, well, that you're actually used from us, so it can also sit behind uh, load balancers, and in the end, it's this and uh, this website that offers the application based on Compo. So, out of the box, if you install it, just like Content Editor in the past, it is disabled. It has to do with licensing, um, so you have to have the proper license before you can enable it. Um, so in a similar way, we have an, uh, that PowerShell library is deployed that allows you to do configuration as code. And the code in this scenario says like enable the UI collective spaces, specifically the draft space area um, that is there. And then it's up to us to make sure that we touch all of the necessary uh, entries on the file system um, that the whole thing becomes enabled, so, and, and that's something we can offer across the versions of the CMS. So in this case, you get an author online button, which is what Kate demonstrated at the very beginning. So if we look at the user interface, um, I think the, the most important bit is, is that, yeah, you get a kind of classic outline view with pages, and where every page is a, a topic. It's, um, yeah, the way to, to display that information with a lot of users find that a, a comprehensible way to, to understand what a topic is about, a one pager, if you will. Um, in this specific example, you see how our, our own proprietary, well, API ref specialization visible, so it can handle specializations, although at this moment in time it requires some compilation. Another thing I think you noticed during the demo is that we would like to own the whole experience here. So we don't see um, more skinning or things like that. So the focus is on content and very accurate content and not on um, exact layout. I don't think we want to compete here with PDFs or with any other kinds of system because that all make the editing experience, which is in line here, a lot nicer. So we see this user interface as for you to navigate and see stuff and review stuff, but we also see this user interface that you can just start typing and you actually implicitly check out and, and later on check in that information. So there is no second screen that opens or a dialogue or a modal or whatever. It's all in line, which is very nice, but it also means that we want to control the experience here. Um, we have two scroll bars. One is across the pages and one is across the outline. Um, uh, as Kate demonstrated, we, we put great effort in making sure that it works not only for a single map uh, with some demo content, but that it really works for, for two, three, five hundred maps and that we still have a, a browser which is responsive and can handle all that information. So that's where a lot of our effort came in because this is yeah, not just something to demo, but this is something that should work for our customers. And I think we all know that one topic with 
uh, one map with five topics is not uh, typical for our customers. Um, what you should also see is in that outline is that we show the accurate navigation title. So what you see here are all the topic titles and not the title stored or the F title, so the logical title that we store in metadata. So that is, that is all the, the, the accurate titles. Um, we can show attributes, although there is already quite some discussion on which attributes to show, because in the end, for the audience we have in mind, this is very, very technical, and um, by default we would actually advise to configure it away. Um, it's difficult to have yeah, good, sensible information here that people know what it's about. Another tab you saw was the properties, and that's indeed the properties that are coming from metadata config. So that's reuse of the properties dialogues that you also see in the Content Manager Explorer web client or even the client tools. So for handling those large publications, we use the lazy loading. Um, so what, what actually happens is when we load the application, we load all of the maps. So we will have, let's say, 100 maps loaded, and all of those maps contain the accurate topic navigation title. We think that that is the best way to give you a nice scrolling experience, because otherwise you have a scroll bar that goes up and down, and if you would drag it halfway, then it's not necessarily halfway, because if not everything is loaded, then you don't know what is coming next or what was loaded before. So by loading all of the maps, we know all of the topic curves, and we have actually a decent-sized scroll bar on the outline as on the pages area. Um, so those maps get injected with the navigation title of the topics. We respect the log title attribute from Oasis Data. We are using the right version to get to the navigation title, so we respect the baseline. So that's all in there. And as Kate demonstrated, we, or more or less, it's a little bit more difficult, but more or less we do a plus five, minus five topics so that you can actually do smooth scrolling. And if you scroll further down your publication, we also start to unload to keep the pressure of the memory of your browser. So that's, uh, of course, if you start editing topics, we don't unload the, those. So uh, everything which is in, in checked out in, in edit mode uh, is maintained open and is, is, of course, skipped for unloading. Now, how do we get to those navigation titles in a, in a fast way? Well, for that, we introduced the fish language title XML field. I think for the ones who know what it is about, this. This is a, a language level field that we introduced, and we initialize that with the titles from the XML document. So for example, if your XML document contains something like this, title introducing, pH, condition, something, something, well, the fish language title XML field will contain this value, introducing the, etc. So technically, it's the inner XML, and we do that for all languages, because we also see further use cases in the future on that. Um, so there are two problems. One, every new incoming document, and it doesn't really matter if it's incoming over draft space or incoming over oxygen or publication manager, we need to have those titles available. So for that, there is a new plugin, and that will run an extract, extract expat expression so that that field is filled in very similar to what you guys know about fish links and fish hyperlinks and all that. But we also have an issue that many of the databases contain a lot of legacy information, and yeah, we also need to pre-fill that. So for that, we have a section in database upgrade tool that does it for you. And because we don't want database upgrade tool to run for a very long time, and, and blocking uh, or, or requiring an extra large upgrade window, we paid a lot of attention to that. And one of the limiting factors is loading with DTDs. 
So we chose to, for database upgrade tool to make the, the XPAP expressions very explicit so that we could load the XML without loading the DTD. And that easily gives you um, several percentages of performance. And I think the configuration is still doable. Most of you have very similar configuration as the out of the box, and it's quite easy to add a couple of extra expat expressions explicitly. Once the system is running, the iWrite plugins, they always load with DTD. So there we have the class attribute available. So there we extract that navigation title using the class attributes, as you know, from many other locations. So when upgrading a customer, keep in mind that database upgrade tool, that this migration file might need extending if you have some very specific specializations around the title attribute, because that's what it comes down to. If you still have a simple title, then you probably still have hits here. So um, as a bit of a, a reminder, uh, but Kate demoed already a lot of these things, is that the rendering supports variable references. So this is our proprietary variable system. Um, Conref is in there, where Conref, I think, is the concept that a lot of users can still grasp, especially about modes and warnings. Those are very easy to imagine that you can still explain that in a, in a one-hour training session. Um, condition is already a lot harder, um, and that requires some more advanced uh, XML writers. But still, we uh, show you which conditions are in or out. So similar like the location manager, we show which sections are not shown, but are um, still in this site, this topic, because it could also mean that you later on need to review your context if those paragraphs should or should not have been visible. So a lot of people will compare this to collaborative review. And I think it's uh, worth noticing that draft space has the same style of deployment as, as InfoShare, so as the content management system. Um, it has the same kind of authentication. The authorization is the same. We respect all of the workflow and the transitions and metadata conflict configuration. And all in all, it's all on the same database. So there is no master-slave setup or synchronization or publishing required. Every action here is direct. And at this moment in time, all you saw was directly on the relational database. There are no caching layers or whatever yet. Um, there are possibilities to do that, but this was shown with direct on the database. Um, something to highlight is that the metadata configuration file we said we reuse this across client tools, so the fat clients and the various uh, browser-based user interfaces. There is also still an extra condition in there that, that you can state that certain fields should or should not be visible if the client is draft-based. So that way you can tweak that certain metadata fields or even groups um, are not shown in that, uh, in that screen and that you only want to see them as an advanced writer. Or, so conditions are in there as well. And explicitly, the draft phase one, I think, is worth mentioning here. So a reminder, uh, again, about a couple of yeah, known issues, limitations, is that we configured a lot of data 1.3 elements, but not all of them. Again, keep your audience in mind. Um, are they really happy with 500 plus elements to select from? Probably not, so it is a limitation. Now we don't, we do not lose information along the way. So if there are unrendered items, you get an icon. So, okay, if you remove the icon and the placeholder, then, then that piece is disappearing, but it's, it's still visible that there is information there that is not shown. Um, as said before, draft space is about content, and we don't want to have lookalike on layouts because we want to have the editing experience uh, in, in a flat user interface. And as said, at this moment in time, draft space does exactly the same as what any user can do on the CMS. So if you log in as, an, as a specific user and you have rights to do stuff in Oxygen, 
then you have the same rights in draft space. If you have limited rights, then you also have limited rights in the handling those large. So that puts the whole create and edit things in the same perspective. Um, this was, I think, our massive new feature. I think for the remainder of the session, we'll complete on some of the changes that have happened on other uh, parts of the 3D and Docs solution, and more specifically on the dynamic experience delivery. We want to highlight some of the stuff. Um, so we have our web application based on DXA. So now uh, um, we're getting into Trivian land where sites and docs come together. Um, this application is still there. Front end wise, it didn't really change. But on the back end, we switched from DXA 1.8 to DXA 2.1. And very, very shortly, 2.2 actually is coming out. Um, but that's all back-end. It's this web application that is built on top of the, the dynamic experience delivery system. So that's where we now have uh, GraphQL and all that endpoints. So if we put this in a picture, then we're Tridian uh, docs as reusing the content delivery platform of Tridian sites. So we share that now. So all of the goodies of the proven architecture is, is there now. What you can see is that we had to do something to have another deployer extension so that 3D and Docs or Oasis data material can easily be injected here. We have uh, search engines on it and all of the other stuff like user-generated comments is there, user-generated content is there. And then we have the, the delivery site so where we have a GraphQL API that is now used under DXA 2.1, and that's the web application that I showed on the previous picture. So visually, not a lot of change, but if you look at platform support, yeah, we switched from uh, from the old uh, CIS uh, API to the new GraphQL API, um, which has a lot more opportunities on, on customization and filtering for a headless system. So that's one picture. You see the two well, let's say silos of information coming together in one content delivery stack. And that is, yeah, <laughs> sorry. Um, in the web application, you can submit comments. So in this application, you can submit comments through that community endpoint in the user-generated content system. And this moderation API on the inside is used in the commenting dashboard. So this is a screen that comes with Content Manager, and that shows you uh, comments that came from the field, so from the customers of the customers, to say so. Um, that dashboard is still there and allows round tripping and feedback and filtering and all that. So that is part of this picture. Um, there are even threaded replies, as you can see in the screenshot. And, and filter options to see what has changed. So that's already in the field since SP1, which is already a while ago, but it's worth repeating it here that, um, that we offer that. A thing that is a bit more recent, and although this is a technical session, um, is that the whole content mashup, so the 3 sites Insights and 3 and Box content manager systems, both providing information to the content delivery system so that you can connect information. It can be marketing information with technical documentation, but it can also be other kinds of knowledge portals, which still is about a nice way to navigate your knowledge plus all of the, the technical ways to write it. So this is this is a big thing um, for us. And yeah, it falls under the what we internally call the umbrella of content mashup. So getting things together from various internal silos. So if we put that in a picture, the thing is that uh, Tridian Docs has a connector over the iMetadata binding interface, so also sometimes referred to as the taxonomy connector, towards Tridian sites, especially for the people online that know it, the keywords and category system. So in essence, the two CMS systems share the keywords and category system. So you can set up a system that you can tag 
certain pages on the Tridian sites with keywords and values. And we can also tag certain publications or certain pages, uh, pop-ins or links uh, inside Tridian Docs uh, with that information. And by publishing them together, both offer their keywords and categories tags or the selected keywords and categories in one database. And that allows you sorry, to build um, a web page that has multiple information silos mashed up in, in one page. So, so there are some classic examples on, on more specific um, technical information that comes from the, the documentation from the 3 doc system and then more of marketing material and images and flashy banners and all that from the Trivian site system. But it can go a lot wider. In the end, we are doing soft linking by tags, so we're not pointing to a specific identifier or a, a specific TCM identifier or ISH identifier. We're doing a loosely coupled thing that you can move those tags around without one CMS have, having to adapt to the other CMS. Um, and there is, yeah, there are way more things you can think of, uh, but that's what Content Nashit is about. So Trivian Docs um, now works with uh, Dynamic Experience Delivery Platform 11.0 that came out together with Sites 9, 3D and Sites 9.0. Um, and in that version, there were things about platform support, as you can read on the right-hand side. Um, but mostly for 3D and Docs, there was a new feature to support the unpublished on their deployer site, and that you, for example, also um, undeploy or unpublish information from the full text index. So it's not only removing stuff from the database, what is called the broker database, but you also need to remove the stuff from the full text index. Assets, um, yeah, we switched to the GraphQL, which is a brand new uh, multi-purpose API. A lot of other webinars already explain details on that. And then there are yeah, distributions and that have to do with the deployer kind of setup. But there is a specific 3D inbox solution if you only need 3D inbox delivery. So that was the delivery part. If we go into open source, um, then I want to highlight that uh, ISH deploy PowerShell library. We already mentioned that a couple of times. Um, we think we simplified it again. In the past, we had an is deploy version per content manager release. We now refactored it. We now realize our library to rule them all. So the latest version of is deploy will work on 12.00 up to 12.04, 13.00, 13.02, 14.00. So you can write your configuration in code and you could reuse that code across multiple CMS versions. Um, the documentation is still online, and we still offer it over the PowerShell gallery. The one thing we did is remove it from GitHub. Um, perhaps we thought initially that we could would get a little bit more traction there, but there was no traction, and it just complicates our velocity. So we rather have a couple of more commandlets spit out than keep syncing with the, the GitHub repository. So. That's what happened there. Specifically, in the last version of Ish Deploy, um, we did things that the commandlets around Content Editor give you an error. So once you test your script, you will have an error stating like, "Yeah, Content Editor no longer exists." So you have to think like, "What what do I want to do next year?" Um, so that's that's the good thing about code as well. And we added the collective spaces commandlet. And another key commandlet we think for the future is the copy ISH file. It's a commandlet that allows you to copy multiple files, or actually even folders and files, um, in a very similar way like the customer specific files does it, uh, that the install tool does it for customer specific files. So Inside the copy ISH file, we do also a mini generate install plan. Um, while copying files, it will replace input parameter placeholders. So that's in there. 
and it would allow you to do an undo because while you copy a file, we always copy the previous file into a, a safe storage so that you can undo, so that you can test your script quite a lot easier. We believe that this has a lot of options for uh, for fixing, not only fixing the, the product, but also fixing your customizations because you can also copy-paste your customizations without having to do a full uninstall install cycle. Um, so definitely have a look at that. Um, most of you noticed probably, but if the remote version was released, I think there's in this timeline that we're discussing, there were two major versions, issue mode 07 and 09, where the 07 was a lot about interactive usage. Um, there are blog posts about that topic. In the 09, it was mostly about having an easier way to not have that your script, you can write your script now in a way that it automatically goes from uh, direct authentication over um, Windows-based authentication, so it does a bit of a fallback so that one line of new IS8 session does the two flavors for you that you don't have to write five lines of code depending on your authentication setup. Um, also, the background path command that was added, which of course requires the API endpoints that I shared earlier. And not to be underestimated, but also is server and is bootstrap, which are the the, the um, PowerShell modules that drive the setup of your server. So in the documentation, we do an, uh, an explanation how you should set up uh, Java or Java help or regional settings of your user or all that kind of stuff. But that is also already automated for you, and we maintain that, and that code has been reviewed, and it's now also working for Windows 2019. So those modules are also available online. And to close things off, yeah, as always, we have, we have our documentation. Our documentation is in the cloud, so to speak. So we continuously update and hotfix it um, where possible. Um, so, but a lot of the features that we described are, of course, documented, uh, also going from API or all of the changes around template specification and metadata config. That is all documented. The documentation itself also got uh, some, some new getting started sections. Um, they are good generic starting points for the product. Um, so they're not one of the features I showed, but that's also things that have changed. Um, what you will not find for the documentation of 3D and Docs 14 is the legacy content delivery uh, documentation, because that is actually what is reach external, so the the, uh, the reach as a as a public content delivery platform. That is still the old one if you need, so the one that comes with 3D Inbox 13. Um, but yeah, we don't want that anymore going forward. We believe in dynamic experience delivery and uh, the DXA, so the Dynamic Experience Accelerator application. And the DD Web App, uh, yeah, that is the the DXA application, that documentation is, is uh, more in line. So this brings us to the end of, of this presentation of all that has, well, the big items that have changed uh, between version 13 and version 14 of the 3D and Docs product line. So I think now is the moment to have a look if there are questions. Kate, did you see any questions along the way come in while presenting? No, th there hasn't been any questions come in, I'm afraid. Um, if you do have a quick question, could you please pop it in the Q&A box now and we hopefully be able to answer it? And otherwise, we give everybody 10 minutes back. <laughs> <clears throat> I think most of you know the ways to get questions answered, either support or over the community. So feel free to reach out. Um, 
en of yeah. morgen is jouw connect in de future, er is more, more to come. Which is not too far away anymore. <laughs> okay, yeah, don't think there's any questions coming through, so um, we'll, we'll finish the, the webinar there then. So thanks, uh, Dave and Katerina, for presenting today. Uh, oh, we've just had one question come in. I don't know, Dave, do you want to have a quick look at it? When will specialization be supported in collaborative spaces? Um, I would say reach reach out to us with the, with the case you have in mind or with the customer you have in mind. Um, wow. <laughs> um, so um, that, that that is something we are working on right now uh, together with our partners to make it happen that in in the most easy easy way possible. There are ways to do it, but it requires engineering involvement. And so if there is a decent case to do it, then, then we can still assist you there. So that was the question about it. when will specializations be supported in collaborative spaces. The next question is, when you say XSLT10, you mean MSXML? Mm, not really. Um, it's, it's just, we need, we, there are various XML engines involved. So the .NET one, there is the MX, MSXML6 one, there is Saxon. So we had to go for the, the lowest common denominator, and it was only adapting some of the XSLT so that we could run it all over the place. Um, just like metadata config XML, we try to make our preview work in all of the user interfaces. It's also single sourced. So if you do a tweak on the preview, you will see that in um, the web associated it in Publication Manager or in the Browse Repository dialog of the client tools. So it's all uh, reused there as well. What do we do with SMEs who just will not, not deal with data? Um, um, uh, yeah, I think that uh, in the future uh, maybe mini templates can help us Uh, uh, yes, Dave. <laughs> yeah, no, on, the, on, the, on the SMEs that who just will not deal with data, yeah, then I, I think you should reach out to product management to present the, the actual case of what we're looking. I think we're currently walking the line between showing just enough, but we're not really stating that it's data. We're just stating that it's semantic tagging at best, and um, you, know, you have to indeed choose a task or a concept, but I don't know if people consider that data. So it's walking the line. I would say reach out to product management to present the case you have in mind on what they really, really dislike, as you state with your uh, multiple not not. The next question is, what about the Aquilinks integration, specifically hooks to check in the CMS directly in batch? Um, there is no change there, so we still have the iWrite plugins, but um, batch is, um, there, there is no possibility to batch to, to my knowledge. Um, Perhaps I'm also missing a bit here at the end of the presentation what it exactly means, but nothing has changed there compared to what you know. So we still have the same integration hooks. Um, so you can do a check one by one, and you can do some fake publishing to have a, a group check. Um, that's what comes to mind. I hope that helps. But that would bring us to the next question is, are keys resolved in collaborative spaces? And Kate, I think you need to confirm, but I think they are not resolved in collaborative spaces. Uh, yes, you are right. Keys are not resolved in collaborative spaces. Okay. Can you take the next one, Kate? Will the insertion of variables and conditions be supported in draft spaces? Uh, for upcoming release, we have no any plans to add it into our scope, so I can't promise you anything. 
Yeah, but it's indeed the walking the line again, eh? because the more advanced concepts you push to draft space, the more difficult it becomes for um, to open up draft space for a wider audience. Eh? Um, so does a regular SME know what a variable is and where is that variable coming from and how do you use the right one that it's a bit controlled? That is um, a very tough challenge uh, in my personal opinion. And last question I can see on my screen is any plans for lightweight data support? Um, at this moment in time, we're using Oasis Data 1.3 behind the scenes, but we, the, the draft space, I assume you point to that, that the draft space user interface only renders what we think is really necessary, and that is close to what lightweight data looks like. Um, to configure lightweight data by itself is already possible by a professional services engagement. So that's, there are, as far as I know, no plans to really add that as standard product. That is not what, uh, what we get from the field as, as a requirement for many customers. So, Dave, there aren't any further questions, so um, I think we'll, we'll finish the webinar there. Um, as you said previously, if you do have any other questions, um, please reach out in the various um, ways that you currently do. Okay, so just going to say thanks everyone for attending today's webinar. Um, the links and attachments section does actually have a couple of links to um, some useful information. Um, the recording will be available here on Bright Talk straight after the webinar, but we will also send a copy to everyone who's registered. And we hope today's session was useful, and we look forward to seeing you again on one of our next webinars. Have a great rest of the day. Thanks, everybody.